When we talked, he said, is there anything new and, and exclusive that you could provide to our Genius Network men, uh, <clears throat> members? And I said, well, you know, I'm writing a new edition of my book, Influence, uh, and I have to say, that book has been very kind to me. Uh, sold a lot of copies, a lot of languages. I was in Poland a while ago, and uh, there's, I have a colleague there, Professor Wilhelmina Wosinska. She said, you know, Bob, uh, your book, Influence, is so famous in Poland, my students think you're dead. <clears throat> and I thought that was an affirming yet sobering observation on the excess of the book. And that's one reason I decided to write a revision Something new, beside, because I wanted people to know I'm still kicking, I'm still thinking. Uh, and so <clears throat> I just finished writing the chapter on reciprocation, the principle of influence that says people feel obligated to give back to those who have first given to them. And I thought, well, there were several new pieces of information I thought I could share. Um, and as we go through it, I hope you'll think about these uh, insights and see if they're, uh, if they're available for you to use in, in your own businesses. Um, but let, let me just uh, provide a first example that sort of takes us through a validation of how this principle works. There was a study done in a candy shop in Southern California. One day, for half of the visitors who came in, the manager met them at the door, greeted them warmly, and escorted them to uh, the candy counter. For the other half, he met them, greeted them warmly, gave them a small piece of chocolate, and escorted them to the candy counter, where they bought 42% more candy than those who didn't get a piece of, of chocolate. And uh, you might explain that in ways other than the rule for reciprocation, that people felt that they had to give back after they had received. Uh, you might say, well, maybe they liked the chocolate, and they wanted more of it. But if you look deeper into the data, the majority of those 42% more people who bought chocolate didn't buy who got chocolate, didn't buy more chocolate. They bought some other kinds of candy. So it wasn't what they had been given, it was that they had been given something that caused them to, make, to change their purchase decisions up to 42%. Um, so, what we, what we know from that is that the act of reciprocation triggered, the act of giving triggers a, an act of reciprocation. But that doesn't mean that what we give is unimportant. Right? Just because people get triggered. Here's what the newest research shows about what you can give first to your customers, your clients, your partners, your colleagues, that will cause them to want to give back to you at the highest possible levels. That will cause them to be ready to give back to you, be standing on the balls of their feet, waiting for the opportunity to give back to you in a major way. There are three things, three features. If what you give is unexpected, it's not just part of the normal exchange, you know how you get a holiday greeting card and you send one in return, that's not, that's not unexpected, that's just normal exchange. Something that's a surprise elevates the willingness of people to want to give back to you. Secondly, is if what you give is seen as meaningful by the recipient, that you've gone to a, 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 a step to give something to them that's meaningful, right? then they want to give something meaningful in return to you at a higher level. And finally, if what you've given is personalized or customized to their identity, to their preferences, to their current needs or challenges, through the roof, they want to give back to you for that kind of kindness, 
right? Okay, so let's take some examples. Uh, here's the first one that has to do with, uh, with unexpected gifts. There was a, a supermarket chain that sent coupons to their shoppers regularly in the mail, and sometimes they would include a coupon for a free gift, a free half gallon of milk at the, at the store. What they were disappointed in is that many of these shoppers who redeemed the coupon didn't then buy more other things, right? So, that is, their total spend wasn't increased by the fact that they got a gift, right? So, they tried something by a, uh, a consultant, not me, told them about the research that shows when people get an unexpected gift, then they're more motivated to give back at high levels. So they did an experiment where one day, everyone who came into the store got a coupon, a surprise coupon for a half a gallon of milk. Those people, their total spend went up by 10%. You know what 10% increase in total spend for a supermarket is? It's unheard of, right? Because the gift they got was a surprise. So what's the implication for you? If you're working online with people, send them a coupon out of the blue for one of your uh, popular items or services, something, at least a discount for it. They're going to feel from that surprise, more obligated to give something back to you. Okay, so that's the idea of something unexpected elevates the power of the rule for reciprocation. How about this meaningful thing? Um, suppose, let's go inside your organization. Uh, suppose you have an idea, an initiative that you're in charge of. And if it is successful, it'll elevate the uh, outcomes of your organization. It will elevate your reputation within it. All right? And uh, you want the people inside your organization to get on board, to embrace this. And you send them information about this new initiative, and you want them to, uh, in, uh, to, to incorporate it into the way they behave. Is there anything you can do? to ensure the likelihood that they will do that? Here's a study that was done in the UK that gives us an example. It was done by the British National Employment Service Office who tried to get people who were not working, who were unemployed, to apply for and appear for uh, interviews for, for a new job. And a lot of these folks, they weren't interested in getting off corporate, off, off uh, welfare. They liked getting their unemployment and they didn't show up for these interviews. They would be scheduled for interviews and they just were no-shows. What the researchers asked the um, office to do is instead of just saying to these individuals in a letter, we have scheduled an interview for a job at such and such a time on such and such a date with Mr. Jones. Here's the time and the place. Please appear. They said in the letter, here's what we did to secure that interview for you. We called the office, we, re we got a return call, we talked with the uh, supervising manager, the supervising manager saw what was the most uh, appropriate fit for you, we contacted that person and we made this appointment. In other words, they talked about the effort that they had gone through to get the appointment. And as a consequence, People spent the effort then to appear for it. They gave back in true reciprocal form what they had received. So, what's the implication? 
in your initiative, you need to tell people who you want to expend effort to get on board the effort that you expended to develop the initiative. How many months it took, how many meetings it involved, how, how much interplay and, and, and revision of the initiative occurred before I'm presenting it to you now. That will cause them to be spurred more likely into action. Okay, so that's unexpected and meaningful. What's seen as a meaningful effort that you undertook to provide that gift or service first, right? or favor. How about the last of these issues? Personalized customized to the identity or the preferences or the challenges of the recipient. I like this one. This is the one I think is more important than the other two combined. If you can convince people that what you're giving represents something for them personally, has been customized for them, right? They will want to give back to you for you and your uh, outcomes. I have a friend who's a consultant who told me about a problem she was having with a particular client, a, a, a particular customer who was notoriously a slow payer when she would send an invoice, and this was true of all of her friends in the industry as well, it would be typically about six months before he would pay. And he, she said, what can I do about this? What, what, what do we know about influence? I said, well, what do you know about this guy? Right? And she said, you know, he lives in a different city, and I really can't find very much about him, except that I know that he's an art lover. So here's what we, suggest, what we decided to do. When she sent the next invoice, before she did that, she went to the art museums and galleries in her town where he would not have had access, right? And, he, and she got a little postcard that depicted one of the exhibits there at the museum that he wouldn't have been able to see. And she wrote on the back of it, from Anna, right, and enclosed it with the invoice. I got an email from her. She said, you won't believe this. That postcard cut the delay in receipt of, of our money in half. We went from six months to three months for the cost of that postcard. Right? Because it was personalized to something that she knew he liked, and then it was a, inscribed to him by her. Now, she didn't need me for this. She took the next step. She found out that not only was he an art lover, he collected modern art. So, the next time, and the time after that, that she sent him an invoice, right? she included a postcard of a piece of modern art that he wouldn't have had access to. Right? Now, this time she didn't write me an email. She called me. She said, you won't believe this. I'm getting paid immediately. Immediately. And all my friends want to know, how did you do this? And she said, I'm not telling them but I'm telling you, you know how this will work now. With an invoice, include something so that in the moment that invoice is open, there's a gift. The rule for reciprocity dominates that situation right there. And that man, in this case anyway, succumbed to the rule of reciprocity. He wrote a check in that moment, right? And I think that's important for us, right? When we, when we give anything, right, if we personalize it, it becomes more valuable. 
Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video and I wanna let you know that I have a new book that's come out and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description or you can wait till the end of this video or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. Let me ask, I'll give you one more example. It doesn't have to be just with a preference, it can be with a person's identity. How many of you have seen, or maybe your companies do this, that you send, uh, you give gifts to customers and clients, like um, a pen, right, with your company's name on it, uh, a calendar at holiday with your company's holidays with your company's name on it. How many of you have seen that or actually participated? Right? It's the wrong name. I'm sorry. It's the wrong name. It's your name, not that customer's name, not that prospect's name. And that's what happened to me. I, when I get things like this, this is from some company. I throw it in the drawer with 50 other pens, with 100 other, you know, with all these other names on them. And then I had one customer who gave me this pen that has my name on it. My name on it. It's for me. And on the other side is their name. And you know what I do with this pen? I carry it wherever I go. And every time I take out this pen, I notice and I remember the gift, the personalized gift that was given to me. Right? It wasn't an advertising device. It was a gift, a personalized gift. Everywhere I go, it's in my pocket. You know how much this costs to do? Now, you might say, come on, I've got thousands of customers. I can't. How about for your best customers? How about for your biggest customers? Talk, it takes about $3 to do that. Are your biggest customers worth that? I think so. Okay. Uh, let me give you, I'm going to finish now. In this new book that I'm writing, we have something called reader's reports, where people write, who've read the book, Influence, write to me, I ask them to write to me, with examples of how one or, they've seen one or another of these principles used on them or by them with great effect. And as regards the principle of reciprocity, here's a reader's report that I got from a guy in uh, Australia. Here's what he says. Not long ago, we moved to Australia where my five-year-old daughter has been struggling to adapt to the new culture and find new friends. Recently, on walks around the neighborhood with my wife, she tried leaving gifts in neighbors' letter boxes. These were really just drawings scribbled in crayon and then folded and taped together into a letter addressed to my new neighbors from Carly at, and then she included her address. And this guy goes on to say, I thought it was pretty harmless, and I was more concerned that it might be perceived as a nuisance. I worried that we would be known as the phantom letterbox litterers. Then funny things started happening. In our mailbox, we started finding cards, proper Hallmark cards, addressed to my daughter that cost anywhere from three to five dollars apiece. Then packets of sweets and small toys started appearing there. If it wasn't for reading your book, I wouldn't have understood this, but the power of reciprocity is unbelievable. She now has a group of friends she plays with in the park across the road every day. Why I like this story is, you see, each of the three features that amplifies the power of the rule for reciprocity was included in those small gifts, as, as, as tiny as they were. They were unexpected. Suddenly, there's a, a, a letter in the box from this little girl. It was meaningful because she created those letters herself. Right? She went to the, to the effort. Right? and customized for my new neighbors from Carly. Lovely. 
I love that example. So if we can all do that, take that counsel, right? I'm sorry. If we, I, I, I don't think this is working either. No. Hello? No. I'm going to use my old professor voice and just shout this out. If we all can do this, <laughs> right, we will dramatically leverage the power of what we give first if we can include one or another of these principles. And if we can include all of them, yeah, and if we can include all of them, really? yeah, yeah. Then everybody wins. Everybody wins. People get gifts, services, and favors that are for them, that benefit them, that give them joy, and they give back to us what's warranted from those kinds of resources. I recently have done my own research on your beautiful premise of reason why. And I want to ask you why you think humans are so much more willing to follow a leader or a marketer when you give them the reason why. It's amazing. My clients, they might be misbehaving or not following my rules if I'm running a big event, which I did last week, and I give them the reason why, and it's magic. Yeah. So I just wanted you to talk a little bit about reason why. It's been so effective for me as a business owner with employees, with clients, as a marketer. If you give people the reason why, it's like a magic to their brain about decision making. So if you could speak to that, I would love it. People need reasons before they act. All right, there's a good evolutionary uh, account of that. We don't want to see ourselves as moving about in, in some sort of impulsive, spontaneous way. We want to see ourselves as having uh, a rationale for what we do. That's consistent with our self-concept. So, if we give people a reason, and sometimes the reason why we give them can be nonsense, but they still move if there is a reason offered in addition to a recommendation itself. We have to give them that justification for it, and it satisfies that primal need to move forward only if you have a strong reason to undertake that step. Right. Yes. Mr. Tim Larkin. Hi. Hello, Tim. I read, uh, obviously, Scott Adams is a huge fan of yours. I read uh, his book, Think Bigly, and read uh, everything you've done. Without getting political, I just think it's really interesting the influence that was used on both sides and what's currently being used and how a lot of it is literally bypassing facts, bypassing things. From a marketing standpoint, it's very interesting. It can be misused, obviously. What's your opinion, A, on the current state of, of influencing people via you know, the political situation that we have going on right now? And then also, do you agree with, uh, with Adams on how he looked at Trump's use of persuasion techniques uh, during the campaign. You know, I think Trump was very uh, effective in his use of, especially using the principle of social proof that we've just talked about. Uh, for example, uh, w before he would begin a rally in, during his campaign, he would tell the television cameras, turn around. Now, Donald Trump is not known for taking the focus off himself, right? <laughs> but he knew enough to say, turn around, look at the crowd. And that legitimized him. He was an outsider. But if all these people were here, now, in an act of what I'm going to call persuasion, he had persuaded the television audience, not, not his, not his uh, physical audience, the television audience to say, this this guy is worth listening to. Look at all these people who are here listening to him. And I think that, was an, that he was entitled to that. If indeed he had that kind of uh, ability to bring in that many people, there was a need for change that was, a, was afoot. In fact, in that election, in the last 100 years, when one political party has had the presidency for two terms, 
in 80% of the next election, the other party takes the presidency. It was a change election. Right? It was a change election. Right? He was the candidate of change. Right? Hillary Clinton was the continuity candidate. So he knew that if he could establish himself with legitimacy, a lot of people want to listen to his vision of change, he was going to get not just the people in that room, but he was going to get a lot of the viewers to say, okay, this guy is worth listening to at this point. Yeah. Yes, hello. Hi. So not really a question, but a uh, testimonial for you is, I was at the meeting in Tempe when you spoke, and we got your persuasion book, and we had a, a small business issue. It wasn't a giant thing, but it was something that was significant enough that I was like, I have to find a solution. So simply by using your information in the subject line of the email, Great. I said, let's work together to find a solution. And it worked. And it worked. Great. Yeah. It's amazing how many opportunities go unemployed when we, rec when we fail to recognize that persuasion is not just about the merits of our case. It's not about what we say or do inside our message. It's also what we say or do in the moment before we send the message that puts people in a, in a frame of mind that is aligned with the message they are yet to encounter. I got an email from a guy. He, is, he said he was a... He had two sons who were Boy Scouts. He sent me a picture of the three of them, and uh, he said, we were trying to sell popcorn to support the Boy Scouts outside of supermarkets. We'd set up a table, and, you know, you've probably seen these things, and as people came out, we would say to them, excuse me, uh, would you like to buy some popcorn? It would support the Boy Scouts. Well, if they wanted popcorn, right, they would have bought some already. In the, right? But the question, do you want to buy some popcorn, focused them on whether they wanted popcorn. Right? He said, then we read your book and we changed the question to, do you want to support the Boy Scouts? You could do so by buying some popcorn. We went from 15% to 75% purchase. And he said, the people who didn't buy the popcorn would give us money anyway. <laughs> they said, we don't really want any popcorn, but we want to support. So where do you focus people first? That's the thing that will come to importance in their mind because what's focal is seen as more important to us because we are paying attention to it. So as communicators... The key to persuasion is to focus people's attention on a concept that they're yet to encounter, but they will when they experience your message. Now they've been readied for it, and they will be more sympathetic to it. Yes? This is an ethical consideration, and I'm curious, when you're trying to persuade or influence someone, is there any limit to how much emotion you use to persuade or influence? Is there any heuristic you would recommend about adjusting that? You know, I don't think the issue is emotion. I, if I want to be, if I want something, one cue that I have is how emotionally I desire that thing. So I'm not going to say that just to, that because it's emotional, it's off, it's off limits. Here's what I would say. Um, I guess what I'm asking is, is there any limit to the amount of emotion you bring into the influence or to the persuasive conversation? Just as much as, yeah, I mean, can you just bring as much as you can to get the outcome you want? Or do you check the outcome along some value set? Yeah, so here's what I would say. Um, emotion is one way people decide what to do. Okay. Right? If we just come in there and get them emotional and then lead them in, in, in the direction of this product or idea, then I have some problem with that. But 
If we decide ahead of time what we have is valuable to them, if we know that they will increase their outcomes as a result of the merits of the case, not the emotions supporting it, then I'm okay with getting them excited about this because they're still going in the direction of a, a, a properly made decision based on the merits, not the emotions. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I'll tell you something. This is an interesting thing. We talk about 25 years that like it was yesterday because it feels like yesterday that we were at the wigwam having dinner with Evan and Bobette and hanging out. But I had an experience a couple of summers ago. I had somebody come to one of my Breakthrough Blueprint events and she was 30 years old, young, you know, bright, young, uh, you know, um, go-getter, marketer. And I, in that moment, I realized, you know, she was born in 1990 is when she was born. And I thought, wow, we've got a whole new generation. I bet a lot of the people that are listening with us even on the Zoom here are, you know, 30-ish type of people who weren't around when the first, uh, when influence first came out. Um, so I think it'd be good if you could maybe tell the, a little bit about the background of your work, because it's been kind of defined your, uh, your life's work since then. Well, as your very gracious introduction suggested, I started out as a traditionally trained and traditionally practicing academic, doing research uh, on my college campus with college sophomores, pretty much as the students in laboratory settings, and recognized there was something missing there. And I needed to get away from those academic constraints into the environment where uh, the influence wars are being waged every day, after all. We're always either sending out influence appeals or uh, receiving influence appeals of one sort or another every mm -hmm. day. And there are certain people who know how to do this because their economic livelihoods depend on uh, using the influence process mm -hmm. properly and effectively. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seemed to me that uh, those professions, sales, you know, management, recruiting, fundraising, marketing, advertising, and so on. Uh, those were the people who really knew what I should be uh, focusing my, my, my thinking on. So mm -hmm. I, began to inv uh, I began to infiltrate their training programs with disguised identity, disguised intent, to learn what they had done that produced yes from people regularly. And I spent uh, two and a half years in, the, in that uh, uh, undercover activity to learn something beyond the college campus where I had been studying this process. Mm -hmm. And it's, I remember you saying how it was initially because you wanted to learn about these things, not to be a practitioner of them, but to protect yourself from them or to help people protect themselves from the sort of illicit use of these uh, of those principles. Right. So that people could recognize them. Exactly. Recognize, resist, deflect, defend. Yeah. But it turned out soon after the publication of Influence that a lot of people were interested, besides that, yeah. in harnessing the process yeah. in ethical ways, in morally responsible ways, to move people into positive choices that mm. they could make, that they were hesitant to make. They were sitting on the fence. They just were dithering. They weren't thinking through what exactly the costs and benefits might be, mm. the merits of one's case, were simply not being presented to them in an optimal way. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted to know about optimization of yeah. the persuasion process for that reason as well. 
Mm -hmm. That's what I found when I first started studying it. Like I, I'm, I've always told you from the moment I read your book, the just the understanding was like having a pair of 3D glasses all of a sudden that you see the, the mechanisms that are at work and why things are uh, turning out the way they are. And the, um, this kind of underlying understanding of influence has really helped me in applying the marketing principles then that you can overlay on top of that when you've got an understanding of why people are reacting, how our brains are responding to uh, things. And one of the greatest phrases that you used in the description is that when these are presented, they trigger this click were pattern that it's just it's almost like an autopilot thing when somebody is presented with this uh with into the right circumstances one of the elements of influence it's almost like instinctual we can't even it's not a um they're not reasoning or thinking it it's just happening uh automatically and you know the, the thing about the click that you were talking about, the thing that triggers their yeah. response, it can be a very small thing. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I like the metaphor of a, a light switch. Mm -hmm. uh, suppose you were uh, in charge of lighting a stadium you know, for a night match or game of some sort or another, you, and you're down in the bowels of the stadium and there's a there's a switch that you just flick and suddenly everything is illuminated. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, things are possible that weren't possible before. It didn't take a lot of strength or effort or time on your part. You just had to know how to locate that switch. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a little bit of effort and all of the power that's stored in the in the power system of mm. that of that arena mm -hmm. flows because of that small thing you did. It goes against the rule of proportionality. There's a, a belief that in order to get big effects, we need to do big things right. to change people in mm. substantial ways. It's just not true. Mm -hmm. There are big power sources inside people and our job is to locate the switch that flicks them on that then drives their behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to ask you, so when Joe Polish and I did our first I Love Marketing conference, it's all about our eight profit activators. And he asked me a question that was just funny because he asked me, do I know all the eight profit activators? Like without looking. And I'm going to ask you just for fun of the, to just maybe quickly name what the six elements of influence are so we can set the context for what we're uh, talking about here. Sure. Would you prefer that I just label them and how they work or give an example? Let's, let's just kind of name them first and then we'll pick uh, kind of yeah. and go through uh, some of them because we, we've got sense. so many uh, stories. Yeah. So the first is the rule of reciprocation. People want to say yes to those people who have given to them first, done a favor, a service, uh, provided a gift. People want to give back. So mm -hmm. you go into a room where you want to be more influential your first question should not be, who can help me here? It should be, whom can I help here? Whose circumstances can I elevate? Whose outcomes can I increase? They will stand on the balls of their feet wanting to do the same for you. Mm -hmm. Next principle is liking. Nobody's surprised that we prefer to say yes to those we like, but there are two small things we can do that substantially enhance the feeling of rapport that people feel with us. And one is to point out genuine similarities, and the other is to give genuine compliments or praise, mm -hmm. as warranted. Right? Mm -hmm. Next principle is social proof. This is a term, by the way, that's used, at, we coined it back in, uh, when, with, with the first edition right. of Influence, Social Proof, didn't exist before. I'm so glad, because I was thinking of using people proof. Right. Okay. But what's yeah. 
second with social media now. Yeah. Think about social media. Social influence. So I'm so right. glad that I, I, I use the term social proof, where the, the fact that a lot of other people are doing something, especially people like us, is the proof mm -hmm. that we should do it too. It's not... Uh, fact-based proof. It's not scientific proof. It's not logical proof. It's social proof. So that's the other thing. Simply letting people know of the others who are around them like them who are choosing or have been choosing our recommended um, step forward. Robert, so, what year, uh, before you continue, what year did the first book come out? The first book came out in 1984. Okay, so this was well before anything with the internet. I mean, it was really, okay, because I was turned on to it in 1996, as you know. Yeah. So okay. it had already been out for 12 years, but that was just at the very beginning of the internet. So I'm sorry for interrupting your train, but. No, no, that's exactly, yeah. the people say to me, you know, Bob, your book is called The Bible of Digital Commerce. There oh, wasn't yeah. digital commerce. Absolutely. How did you see, how how did you foresee this? Mm -hmm. How did you look forward and see this 40 years, 35 years later? Yeah. And it was by looking back. Right. At what were the factors that have always driven behavior mm -hmm. in our species? Mm -hmm. Look back at the evidence to be able to predict how we as a species will behave in the future. Yeah. Love it. Okay. So social proof. Then carry on. Next is authority. We, if we're uncertain about something, one way to reduce our uncertainty is to see what the experts are saying mm -hmm. and what they are doing. And if we have expertise, we have to be sure that the people who we're trying to move in our direction are properly informed of that mm -hmm. before we ever try to influence them. Mm -hmm. Next principle is the principle of um, scarcity, right? Uh, people want more of those things they can have less of. It's just the way we are, right? Mm -hmm. So things that are rare, scarce, dwindling in availability, if we properly inform people of those characteristics, they get a little crazy to I'll have. I'll tell you what, that's the absolute truth. I've got a, some, I'm, I'm hyper-vigilant of what's going on in my world because I'm I'm aware of all of these things. And so I always kind of observe the situations that I get into and I see how influences that work in my life too. And I'll share a couple of stories with you as we go on, but please, please continue. Yeah. <clears throat> then the next principle is commitment and consistency. People mm -hmm. want to be consistent yes. with what they have already said or done especially in our presence, mm -hmm. especially publicly. Mm -hmm. They don't want to say one thing, do another, or, 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 or misspeak by saying one thing and then uh, contradicting it the next time. They want to be congruent with what they have already made a commitment to. Mm -hmm. So asking people to take very small steps in our direction causes them to be much more likely to want to continue to take steps, even outsized steps mm -hmm. in our direction in the future. Mm -hmm. right. And then uh, finally, there's a new principle. Uh, That's what I was going to ask you about. So now this is exciting that you got to the point, These that's masterwork of the six. And then in revisiting now, you've discovered a, a, a final, a, a new one. Yes, and I'm calling it unity. I love that. Uh, but it has to do really with membership in a particular group. Yes. Right? A tribe. Mm -hmm. Some in-group that defines us. And if a communicator can arrange for us to see him or her as inside that group, one of us. Yes all the influence barriers come down for that communicator. Mm -hmm. We say yes to those people, we cooperate with them, we believe them, we trust them. Those people who are of us become people who we want to favor and follow. So my thing as, as being more of a giver and then you know sometimes in naive ways, right? 
I uh, never really liked networking that much because mm -hmm. in traditional ways, I always just wanted to go and see what I could give. And so I'm, you know, right now taking advantage of learning new skills and really appreciate the book. And I, um, I'm really excited about the new career that I'm starting. And there are certain people that I want to reach out to that feel like in terms of where, where I am in the, in the thoughts that, you know, like in terms of future thought leadership, mm -hmm. they feel like they will be my peers. Mm -hmm. And for me to reach out at this point, it's hard, it, like, I'm not sure exactly how to reach out without having taker energy since I'm just basically starting. And, you know, these are more established people. Like, for example, Annie Lala in the book, I think is just one of the most brilliant minds around love. And right. I really want to be in conversation with her. I'm starting a podcast and it's in pre-production and it, you know, I don't know how to sort of like um, go in with giver energy when there is that space where, you know, I'm not, I'm not at that point right now at that, level career wise and how to make those contacts in a way that isn't in taker energy and is in giver energy and feels good to everybody. Well, here's what I would say. And, and, and first off, we all start out with where we're at and then we're going to go, go to a different level. We have to develop the skills and capabilities and the resources in order to do it. So what everyone has, if they don't have time, they have money they have attention, they have energy, they have effort. Uh, at this gym I work out at, there's a big thing on the wall that says effort is your responsibility. So what most people that are really awesome, cool people uh, like and appreciate is when someone actually knows their work. So if someone, uh, I get, you know, I cannot tell you how many, it's, it's now in the thousands of podcasts an interview request over the last decade that we have said no to because people show up with just a want like, Hey, I want to interview. They don't even like, you know, they haven't listened to any of our podcasts. Dean gets the same thing. Yeah. You know, people require, they haven't listened to, they don't cite a single episode that they've listened to. They do not give sincere compliments. It's like those uh, bullshit spam things you'll get on social media with, would you really like to grow your following in your channel? We're an agency that, and it's like how how dumb and in, 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 in like uh, how much of an amateur do you have to be to even try to fake sincerity if you can't if you don't even have any you know but it, it, and I talk about it in the book as you know like you know flattery works but it's not really it's like cotton candy it's not really sincere and so one of the things that um, uh, anyone that's a genuine giver if someone reads their like for Annie if you wrote Annie a sincere letter like you know i really like your work and here's why that would be that could be a way to get her attention secondly um and i don't mean just the attention that'll get her attention but to really want her to uh, be is is to is to write someone a letter if you have and i'm not saying making this up i mean it it, it needs to be real and or or you'll develop a reputation of being a taker uh, it, but if you were really impacted by someone like they were a domino for you or you found their material just useful and interesting if you wrote them an ad saying, hey, I read your book or I looked at your website and here's three things that I think would be valuable to you. And I wanted to provide these to you because I have an ask and I don't just want to ask you blindly. Uh, I love I, I, I admire you. I think you're smart. I'm trying to, you know, build a following here. And I love to have you, you know, be one of my guests. And if you can, you know, either now or in the future, but here's what I got for you. And, and if uh, I'd love for you to say yes. And if, if you're not able to, what would I, what could I do or what would, would need to be required in order for you to uh, say yes to my request? Um, so you can show up with uh, value. You can show up with connections. Uh, you can show up with ideas and strategies. Uh, if you can get the physical address of somebody and mail them something that is sincere. I mean, here's the wrong way to do it. Like people often will send me their books that have never read any of my books and they'll ask for a book blurb and they don't, they're not a client. I have no relationship with them. I don't even know who the hell they are. And they're sending me a book asking me to blurb a book. And it's just like, you know, I charge $6,000 an hour when I do consulting and I like, do you want me to, do you want to pay me to read your book? And, and even if you're paying me, I wouldn't read the book if I'm not interested in the topic. And they don't, and, and a lot of people send me stuff that 
they could find out on social media what the hell I'm interested in versus what I'm not. And so you come across as a really sincere, genuine person, or you wouldn't even have asked the question like that. You don't want to come across. So that sort of energy is just good energy to begin with, because you can sense it that you don't want to be like, you read my whole book, right? I actually want to help you because you read my whole book for no other reason that I like people that actually read my stuff, right? And so um, what what I did in the beginning, like with carpet cleaners, I'm going to share something with you and you can extrapolate this into a million different ways. There was all these carpet cleaners that were selling something nobody wants to buy. I had to figure out how to successfully persuade people that don't have, um, that don't want to buy carpet cleaning. Nobody, some things are bought. You're going to go buy food. You're going to go buy clothes. You're going to go buy entertainment. Some shit has to be sold, right? No one wants to hire a carpet cleaner. No one, no one's like, really can't wait till the cat pees in the corner so I can call a carpet cleaner. Like no one's doing that. So I had to figure out how to sell this stuff. So I, I would read books like Influence by my buddy, Dr. Robert Cialdini. Uh, Gina, if you could please post the interview I did with Robert in the chat, that would be great. Watch my interview with, with, with Robert. Uh, Chris Voss on negotiation. Gina, I'll ask you if you could post an interview I did with Chris Voss in the chat. Uh, these are all trainings uh, on, on how to you know be better at this sort of stuff. But with the carpet cleaners, they always needed to get into, and now I'm really going to be behind on my, I, I do this to myself. This is one of my uh, kryptonites <laughs> is, uh, is, uh, is I go too long. So um, I would identify Mr. and Mrs. Bigwig and all the carpet cleaners they're competing with were doing quotes and estimates. And they, uh, and everyone does a quote or estimate. And what I would say is like, and they would run across the gatekeeper and they they weren't talking to the decision maker. And, and, and it was like a terrible way to present themselves. And I said, find the decision maker, who they are, a man or woman, and uh, find their shoe size. And this was before the internet existed. It was way harder to find information on people uh, prior to, uh, you know, the internet. Now you can just do searches and literally in a matter of minutes, you can find things about people that before took you know, hours to, 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 to find. And I would say, get a pair of shoes. And back then it was like, you know, Reeboks or Nike were like the two big, uh, when I first started doing this, those are the two big shoe brands. Now there's a million, but uh, I said, find their shoe size and then write a letter that says, dear so-and-so, I needed a way to get my foot in the door. And I wanted to come up with a clever idea to meet you. And uh, so I wanted to send you one shoe. I'd love to meet with you next week, either on Tuesday or Thursday, because I've got ways that you can really make the you know, the environment of your building look better. And it was usually done for commercial work, for commercial carpet cleaning. And they would send them one shoe by a uniform courier. So the person had the sign for it. And I said, most of you are not going to do this because it's logistically involved. But if you do, you're going to get, and if you send out five to 10 pairs of shoes, you're probably going to get calls from between one to three people. And they're going to call you, they're going to meet with you, and they're going to hire you. And I would tell this to groups of people, you'd be lucky if one out of a hundred did it, but every single person that would do it, they would always get the call and they would always get their foot in the door. And, and they basically send the letter, I needed a way to get my foot in the door and I'll bring the other shoe. And the other, no matter who, how rich they are, no matter, they want the other shoe. Mm -hmm. And it became a very, but here's the other thing. It, it doesn't just hit the emotional side of someone wanting something. What it does is it actually demonstrates this is a very creative person and I want to meet them. So you could send whatever you want to send. It doesn't necessarily need to be a shoe, but if you can send physical things or you send a really sincere video uh, and you just start developing rapport and you say, look, I don't have a lot to offer you right now, but I'd love to have you on my show. And here's why. And you give them the real reasons why uh, or whatever the request is. And if you can offer anything that they're looking for is because here's the thing, you know, what needs solved? Everybody has some pain or angst in their life. And if someone could show up and bring some relief or solve it, uh, that's a way to, uh, to to make it happen. So those are some of the exercises I would do. And then finally, since you have my book, the McKay 66, that's Harvey McKay's formula. If you actually did that with like the top five people that you want to meet and you, you'll meet every single one of them. I mean, any, anyone, no matter who they are, if they're, if they're reachable, like, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, and obviously don't, 
you know, don't try. Everyone wants to meet Oprah. Everyone, you know, and, and, and frankly, some of the most interesting, valuable people on the planet are not famous. And, uh, it, and knowing famous people, and I know a shit ton of them, has nothing to do with, you know, reaching opportunities. It's really finding people that you can collaborate with and that you can, you know, be useful with. And that's where genius networking comes in. You know, the reason I call it genius networking is it's not normal networking. It's finding people that have skills and capabilities that will collaborate with your skills and capabilities. And together you can create something and you can facilitate them getting what they want and that's the list you make first. The list is what are they, who are they? What's their skill? How can I help them make that list of all the ways you can help them and then help them with that? And then as a result of doing that, they'll probably help you. Does that help? It helps a lot. Thank you. Today, I'm going to talk about how to become a key person of influence because um, I actually figured out I had been doing this for a long time, but when I met a bunch of the other sharks, and there's now 10 of us. And each one of these, you're going to see some new ones, John Paul DeGiorio on the end there, and Steve Tisch this year coming out. Jeff Foxworthy was a shark for a season. I did three seasons, 175 segments. I learned a lot from these sharks, learned that they were key people of influence in their industry. Um, and so I said, you know what, let me write down how I became a key person in my industry. And it was really kind of simple when you think about it. It's the old 90-10 rule. It's 10% of the people make 90% of the income. But actually, really, today, it's almost 2% of the people are making 98% of the income. So, um, you know, that's, you know, the, this middle 10% actually have 90, but it's, it's now becoming even closer to a 98% two percent ratio. So there's five things that I say that you need in order to become this key person of influence. We're going to go into each one of these very shortly today because of the time constraints, but get a perfect pitch, publish your ideas, productize your value, raise your profile, and also then seek great partnerships. And I think that's one of the reasons why many of us are here today is to seek great partnerships. So the perfect pitch. I have a formula I use for this. T's, please, and C's are the three steps of that. And the guy that gave me the most unbelievable perfect pitch the first time I real realized it, his name was Arnold Morris. And he was at the Philadelphia Home Show with a knife. He's cutting through a Coca-Cola can, then a hammerhead, and a muffler. And then he said, it's so powerful, this knife, that it can still cut through a tomato and you can read the Sunday newspaper through it. This was called the Ginsu knife. I said, Arnold, that pitch you just gave, I'm gonna put it on TV, take a camera, capture it, and take it to millions. Because he had only been taking it to 10 people at a time for 30 years. He had a perfect pitch, but I said, let's take it to the masses. That was the perfect pitch. Not somebody like this that came on Shark Tank and couldn't even talk, okay? So uh, that makes a bad pitch when you cry, all right? In fact, you know, when I got done with Arnold, we went back to the Philadelphia Home Billy Show Mays. and Thanks watch this, Billy Mays. Me. I'd like to introduce to you the Washmatic International. It's the only washing system in the world that works direct from a bucket. <laughs> Who cares, all right, all right? That was not a good pitch, all right? That was Billy's First infomercial, God bless him, I did that infomercial. Fortunately, I didn't lose a lot of money, but I learned early on you need to create a perfect pitch, and here is Billy's last infomercial. The dull saw is no ordinary saw. It uses counter-rotating technology to cut through all types of material with unmatched safety, speed, and precision. It's a process that took eight years and cost millions of dollars to develop. That's a perfect pitch. A hundred million dollars in sales. God bless Billy Mays. His family still gets a royalty to this day now that he's passed away a few years ago. But that, he, when he passed away, 62 products on television when he died. God bless him. So, yeah, there's other people we can talk about. Lazo Freeman, a personal trainer over in the UK, came to us. And I said, what's your perfect pitch, Lazo? I get a kick from motivating individuals to be the best they can be. That sounds a little bit generic to me. Not a great pitch, but this is what we turned it into. I only do exclusive radical 12-week body transformations with business leaders, celebrities, and public figures who achieve amazing things at work. 
at work, but ordinary things make it. Okay, how about that one, all right? This guy has a 12-week waiting list now for people that want to use his services. That's what I call a perfect pitch. And by the way, you should have a 30-second perfect pitch, a 60-second, a 90-second, 120-second. You never know when and who you might have to make that pitch to. Tease, please, and seize. Publish. Now, there's a lot of people here. I've seen a lot of people have their own books already. So yes, having a book is great. Um, I had my own book, and that helped me get on Shark Tank. Actually, I, I can talk a little bit about that afterwards maybe, but books and blogs and newsletters, trade journals, newspaper articles, magazines, publishing creates credibility. And without a doubt, I know there's, I, I see folks here that are go on the Today Show, we, we, we know who we are here, and things like this. So everybody knows they need to get the publishing credibility because, you know, you keep your customers. If you have a newsletter that comes out, you get new customers. We talked about credibility. You stand out from the competition. You enhance your reputation as an expert. You build your brand. And it has a longer shelf life than other marketing because you can give your book out, your newsletter, continuity. You can do clubs, et cetera. So, yes, publishing is very, very powerful. And this lady, Hadi Hassan, she was a struggling female plumber. And she said, what can I do? I, you know, I, I don't know, what, what, what do you have for me? I said, well, let's come up with something. We've now published over 350 books for people through our organization now. And what we did with Hadi is we said, The Joy of Plumbing. And that book now has taken off. It's a bestseller over in the UK. This book has positioned her. Now she started her own association. She does radio talk shows, television shows. She's got a 16 DVD set of DVDs that she sells on an ongoing basis. And she now is a rock star plumber. So publishing has put her into a whole new league. Third step, productize. Because a product never sleeps. I have friends that are chiropractors, doctors, lawyers, but they can't bill while they're sleeping, all right? So I say you gotta productize your assets. We live in a global idea economy right now, and productizing is what it's all about. In fact, when I met Tony Little, he was a bodybuilder, personal trainer, all right? Look at Tony, he looks a little different today, but um, Tony Little, I said, how do you make money, Tony? I get $40 an hour. I start at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I work people out all day long. So at the end of the day, he made a couple hundred, 500 bucks maybe if he had 10, 12 sessions. Like, Tony, how, how can we unpack your, unvaluable, your valuable IP? He said, Kevin, he said, what I do, I, get, I can target train women primarily if they got a little bit of arm fat here, love handles, glutes, you name it. I target train them. I said, boom, okay. Brought him into the studio. We shot six one-hour DVDs, created the target training DVD set. Here it is, $300 million in sales for Tony Little. He was getting a check for about a million dollars a month, actually, at one time. So this was all by productizing his valuable IP. Tony's done billions. We went on to do the Gazelle with Tony Little, which actually has now done over $1 billion in sales by productizing. Here's another guy, Jack LaLanne. He's a healthy old fitness guru, another guy that's passed away, God bless him. But I said, Jack, he hadn't made any money. This is about 20 some years ago. And I said, what do you do to stay so healthy? He said, I drink juice every day. Okay, Jack, here it is. We're gonna make you now a healthy and wealthy old fitness guru, okay? <laughs> $1 billion in juicer sales. Jacqueline, unpack your valuable IP. Fourth thing, profile. Raise your profile, so important. You know, let's talk about the evolution of the industry. It took radio 38 years to get to 50 million people. It took television 13 years, the internet four years, iPod three years, Facebook two years, but guess what? This guy, he did it in six months to a billion people, Psy, okay? The Gangnam guy, this guy just blew the market away because what did he do? He didn't use the old media, a few channels broadcasting to millions, he used new media, which is millions of channels broadcasting to a few. And that is the new big 
Small is the new big. Big companies have a harder time competing against you because just like this right here, I have a 35,000 square foot studio. I shoot my infomercials. I can shoot the same quality on this little iPhone that I do in my studio. And that's where we're going with this because th here's a guy, Phil Gear, 810 million views. What mattered to me today? Michelle Fawn, 580 million views. She gets seven figure sponsorships from companies that pay her to show how to put makeup on for Asian girls and Jenna Marbles, over a billion views, how to trick people into thinking you're good looking. So, you know, who would want me on TV? A lot of people say, well, if a blanket with arms can become a TV sensation, so can you. The Snuggy, $400 million in sales, 26 million units. Last thing, partnerships, and I'm out of time, so I'm just gonna wrap it up here. I went to Gutty Ranker, they do beauty, I do hard goods, I said, let's form a venture. We'll take people that come to you with hard good products, you bring them into the venture, people come to me with beauty products, we formed a 50-50 joint venture, very successful. Everybody in this room has the ability to partner, just like Invent Help, which helps inventors, they come to us, we have a program where we'd line up 7,000 companies to invest in inventors' ideas. And that's because we have engineers, we have manufacturing companies, we have every kind of company that can help an inventor with his idea. It's all about partnerships, and that's what everybody here is here today, this week to do. Yes, so, something we're doing in-house too that may be a, a benefit tying this in is you know, talking about increasing capabilities as many of us are, as entrepreneurs are looking to do more with less, you know, I mean, most, most people are probably familiar with sites like Elance, Guru, Freelancer, that type of thing. I see a lot of people will hire and you know, source out, I'm looking for this person to do this, and then you have to go through, it's almost like hiring someone in-house, and it becomes, you know, you know, can become a uh, taxing type of thing, complexity-wise. One of the things we've been doing for about six months from designing websites to writing copy to creating tests against our control pieces <coughs> in the full page ads with magazine. I mean, a, well, a whole variety. I bet you we've done at least 20 projects. Uh, recently, we were working on a campaign with Ariana and we wanted a re, uh, redesign of a site. And so we submitted it not just to hire somebody, but as a contest, the way Joe talked about, we went through the crowdsource blueprint process, posted it up. $150 contest, we got over 40 different versions submitted to us to pick and choose the best. Now we didn't go with any of them, but we pulled out an idea from this one, an idea from that one, an idea, and we rewarded the, the number one, which I recommend guarantee a, a prize winner in it because you'll get more people engaging in it. But think about writing copy, think about designing mail pieces, designing ads, you know, all the different intelligence Joe talked about is instead of looking to hire it, look at it from a perspective of running a, a, a crowdsource contest to make that happen. It's a huge multiplier, huge capability. I mean, we're seeing huge di dividends here in the company uh, overall, just using it on that small of a scale. We're getting ready for 2015 to you know, really take it to a whole nother level with marketing, advertising, the way Joe described. What if we did an I Love Marketing meetup uh, specifically designed on this idea where everyone would have to fill out the thing if I gave it to you, but you had to pay um, Hundred bucks to come to the meeting. How many of you would sure. do it? Absolutely. Okay. So if you're interested in that, then give us a card, and we'll do it. And uh, and what I'll do is I'll give 100% of that money to um, to Charlie here because she has to freaking organize these things and do that. And you can spend the money on food or drugs. <laughs> even, <laughs> even even yes, even hookers if you want. I don't really care. <laughs> so <laughs> um, yeah, but I think we should we should do that, and then we'll we'll figure out if people if they pay if they pay more attention. And that sort of thing, because this this idea is completely oh, yeah. and utterly badass. So, do you want to talk about Tony and what you're doing with this, or no, 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 just because of time, oh, okay. just because yeah. of time. Uh, if so, you know, but that's, I mean, that's just a, a, that, mm -hmm. that's where my thinking is right now, and we have uh, several very high level people that are putting together, you know, contest, and you know, we're putting it together. So over the next few months, we're going to learn. Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to have real, you know, we're going to have real uh, campaigns that that we launch. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. He did the he did the EAS physique transformation that ended up becoming the uh, Body for Life um, contest and 
Right. Well, see, everything measured and reported, uh, you know, it's the whole everything measured improves, everything measured and reported improves exponentially. If you look at any sort of contest from Super Bowl, imagine the Olympics without gold medals. How hard would people work? You know, we live in a world that, you know, it's like the pussification of America with a lot of stuff. Uh, and that's a technical term, by the way. But it's uh, where, you know, yeah, where, where, oh, like, you know, everyone, you know, it's like this equality thing. No, you actually, f people win, people lose. And whoever kicks ass wins big. You know, and if you, and people love a challenge. I mean, you know, you want to give people a reason to work hard. Like one of the things I learned in contests was I can teach goal setting, I can teach marketing to people. The moment I said to a carpet cleaner, if you do a really good job systemizing your marketing and your advertising or increasing your net, net or gross profits, because my two categories when I first started this, and it was a spokesperson contest, because what I learned is if you charge people money, to just try to buy things from you so that they can win, you're running a lottery. But if you have a spokesperson contest where they're competing to be a spokesperson and it happens to come with prizes, that's how you do it legally. Now there are certain states that you can't do any contests at all. However, uh, there's plenty that there are, so you don't, it doesn't matter. And uh, what I learned is that I can teach people marketing strategies and I sold them in books and courses and still do. I mean, I, we sell courses. Like, you know, all these marketing strategies, if you want exact step-by-step -step things, sample sales letters, copy, we sell all that stuff. If you guys don't want to recreate the stuff, you can give us money, we'll give you some of that stuff. Um, and what I learned is that the moment you start giving someone an opportunity to win a prize, they just work harder. They, it, 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 it ignites something inside people that cannot be ignited any other way. There's a community, even when you see all these charity races, you know, you give people a goal, here's what we're trying to do, you know, that, you know what I loved about the, um, what was the ice bucket challenge? Uh, it, yeah, that was such an intrusive sort of contest because I, I thought, not, well, it, more of a, not even call it a contest, but it's like, you have people on Facebook, you know, you, you, it was a direct response campaign, okay? You have 24 hours to dump a, dump a bucket of ice on your head and share this with how many people? Was it three? three. three? You know, name, call them out. And people are sitting there just trying to like waste their time on Facebook like most of the country does, just kind of going through. And all of a sudden they've been called out and challenged. And all of a sudden it created this massive viral campaign. And if you just look at the aspects of that, it created a sense of urgency, 24 hours. You had to call someone out, right? And if they didn't do it, they look like an asshole. Or at least you want them to think that. I had a million people call me. I didn't dump a bucket of ice on my head. Fuck that. So, uh, but what I did do is I freaking go to Dean Graziosi, who calls me out, Tony Robbins and Brendan. Yes. It's a Brendan yes. Bouchard. And I called the Make-A-Wish Foundation because I gave Bill Phillips the idea to donate money to Make-A-Wish. And, and because of my idea, he became the single largest individual contributor in the history of the world to Make-A-Wish. So I know the CEO of Make-A-Wish and everything. The main headquarters of Make-A-Wish is here in Phoenix. So I go down there and Dean did this contest. He goes, I'm going to give money to ALS, but what I'm going to do, I want to raise $100,000 for up to $100,000 for Make-A-Wish. And so whoever shares this video, I'll donate a dollar. Whoever, uh, no, whoever likes it, I'll donate a dollar. Whoever shares it, I'll give $2, up to 100 grand. Within a matter of like two weeks, he had over 5 million views on that video through Facebook. And so he raised his 100 grand, but now he's going to multiply it and, and, and make a wish. I gave them the idea because they have this blue day coming in, I think it's in April of 2015. Mm -hmm. They want the world to know about make a wish on blue. So I show them this freelancer video. I said, here's what you do. You crowdsource, you have freaking people wear blue t-shirts, do anything blue and, whoever, and just share it. And whoever does a good is going to win all this stuff, but they're not even going to win money. They're going to donate money. I go, it'll be the biggest thing that's ever happened to make a wish. Now, because nonprofits and charities are very bureaucratic, we'll see if they can like, get this shit done. But Dean is actually, Dean himself will probably end up donating $500,000 just to make a wish with the way he's spinning it. And he'll do more, one individual using marketing, than like half of their employees combined. You know, and, and so anyway, there, there's so many different ways mm -hmm. that you can spin this stuff. So I will shut up because we, we're past time and we, we're going to do this parody. So was that, was that a good use of your time? Yeah. Okay, I hope you found that video awesome and useful. So if you want to get a free copy of my book, I want you to click here. And if you want to watch some more videos that will be useful and awesome, click here. Go ahead. They're over here. Do it now. Come on. Thank you. Watch them.